46. <laughs> 446. Straight. 
Now he's from 494. It's just like his great love. 494. Join us in the last time. <laughs> message from a series of messages I've been preaching here on Sunday mornings from the admonition of the Lord Jesus which says he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches 
And our text this morning comes from this opening chapter once again. Uh, John is called up into heaven, I believe signifying the very rapture of all the church of God. And uh, if you're not one that uh, would agree with that position as to what's happening to John there and, and its significance, uh, then one thing that's clear by the context of chapter 4 and 5 uh, that we would all have to agree on, and that is that once John is up there, uh, the scene that he beholds has followed the judgment seat of Christ, and we are all there. We're there. Again, whether his personal calling up represents the calling up of the church or not, and I, and I believe it does, once he's up there, he's witnessing all the church being up there, having been delivered, the Bible says, from the wrath to come. And the wrath to come is defined in Revelation chapters 6 through chapter 19. And someone says, well, why would the Lord rapture the church from that period of tribulation? Those that deny that doctrine today would reason, why would He deliver us from that, from that period of wrath? Well, the Bible says we're not appointed to wrath, but we're, we're appointed to salvation and we're going to be with the Lord. And uh, our wrath, amen, the wrath that was due us for our sins uh, was already settled there at the cross of Calvary. Thank God uh, Jesus Christ died for us. But while destruction and devastation and deception and all that uh, woe that's coming on the earth in that short period of tribulation period there, uh, while that's happening down here, uh, the church is seen in heaven. We're with each other and more importantly, we're with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it says here in verse 1, After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said... Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, we're going to think about both of these chapters today, chapter 4 and chapter 5, two of my favorite chapters in all the Word of God. But I want to use a statement here to frame the message as we look at it there, referring to the event that we know as the judgment seat of Christ, John is called up and he beholds all the saints up there in glory. And he says, quote, Behold a throne, behold a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now that's good news, amen. <laughs> and that's a wonderful, glorious truth, but it's also a sobering reminder as we seek to avoid the entanglements of this life and all the snares of sin and all the distractions of the world that in heaven there most certainly is a throne, and that throne represents power, that throne represents authority, that throne represents royalty. And John is telling us here, I was called up there and I saw it. I saw it for myself. He said, Behold a throne, and he adds by the weight of inspiration to the virtue of this personal eyewitness experience. He says, One sat upon the throne. Now, uh, not only... Is there a throne, but there's one upon the throne. And it's His throne. And as sure as we all live and breathe, those of us that are saved, having believed on the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, those of us that have trusted Him and we belong to the church, uh, members one of another, joined together by His Spirit, we are destined to stand before this throne at what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And every one of us shall give account of Himself to God. And that's the thought this morning. Let's prayerfully, let's go to the Lord and ask His blessing upon it. God, I, I ask that You'll use me today to preach this message. Lord, I ask that You'll set me aside and, Lord, uh, get Your message to the hearts of Your people. God, communicate it by Your Spirit. Uh, Lord, I always want to do a good job, but uh, that's not what's important about this important subject. Lord, what's important is that we receive it as it is in truth, the Word of God. And that we are warned today. We leave here uh, having been warned that we are destined for the judgment seat of Christ. And that we make adjustments to our life right now in light of that event ahead of us. And then of course, Lord, we pray for the lost today. That they'll understand that time is running out. And that they have but a few days, Lord, to get things right between them and thee. And the only way to get right is through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for them and rose again. And Lord, that they might be saved. We pray for their soul today. Ask you to bear witness to the truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I said, this is the ninth message, the intended uh, final message of what I've been preaching here concerning 
Jesus' statement, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And going back to the first message, I was seeking to just set this all up there, showing the historical background of how John actually received this revelation there. Uh, the Bible says it was communicated unto him by his angel, that is the angel of the Lord. In the passage in Revelation chapter 1, the angel of the Lord turns out to be the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And I was just trying to establish what it is that the Spirit would have us to hear that was said to the churches was actually quite literally first said by the Lord Himself. And I mean uh, Christ Himself personally appears to John and He tells John to write this down. Write this. And the dots that were to connect uh, to this is that Jesus literally spoke to John and we're to equate what he literally spoke to John, uh, amen, and what John was going to write, uh, with what John writes. We're to equate the authority of, of each there, and that is the definition of inspiration there, that what John has written, and we have in our possession, is the inspired Word of God. We have it by virtue of the preservation of God's Spirit, and uh, it is in fact what the Spirit would say to the churches. I hope you understand the difference, the revelation of the message there that is given to John by the mouth of Jesus Christ. Again, he speaks it literally to John. What we've been given isn't by the appearance of Christ. What we have, we have in our Bible. The Spirit would say this to us by the Word of God, and what we ought to draw from this is that there is no difference. There is no difference from John having the Lord's appearance before him, communicating this message to him, and what John sits down and writes that we have in our lap this morning, amen, and I have before me on this desk, amen, this is the Word of God, and there is no difference from what came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ and what we read here on the page. And it is what the Spirit would say to us, and of course, uh, uh, what He's saying there to John, there at the end of the first century. And the Lord would have us to give ear to it. And what that means is He would have us to give heart to it. Uh, from that first message, we went to the churches of chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, seven different messages involving developments uh, throughout church history. And there's given reproof, first of all, to the, the period immediately following the apostolic age where uh, John is alive, the other apostles are off the scene, and even the apostolic signs and wonders are gone by this time. And John, of course, is being committed to, to his trust uh, the writing of the final book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, actually. And uh, those saints at that time are being commissioned. They're being warned against leaving their first love. And what we've seen is they're doctrinally straight, they're sound, they're active, they're involved, but Christ said He had somewhat against them and that they had left their first love. And then in the next development of church history, which is marked by uh, the church of Smyrna there, there's a period of faithfulness, uh, that is there in spite of great intense suffering. And the Lord responds to their suffering saying, Be thou faithful unto death. Be thou faithful unto death. And the intense suffering they suffered in the second century, in the third centuries, at the hand of those foreign nations that they would carry the gospel of Jesus Christ into, and mainly at the hand of pagan Rome. And pagan Rome, of course, absorbed every other culture in the world and every other religion in the world. But when it came to the saints of Jesus Christ, there was just no working with them. And the reason was because their belief was that the Scriptures alone were the Word of God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the message of God unto salvation, and that Jesus Christ alone was the Savior. God alone was the God of Israel. All men were sinners. They need to be saved. They had to be warned of hell. They need to be commissioned towards being born again. And it was just a hard bunch to work with when your objective is simply to gain control and have peace and harmony in that gained control. It's Pax Romana, it's called Roman peace. That's the objective. And they found out believers of Jesus Christ who believe the Bible to be the authority, who believe uh, the gospel to be the only message of salvation, they're a hard bunch to work with. And so they're out there preaching and they're teaching. And again, they're telling folks how to be saved. And they're warning them against their idolatry and their false gods. And of course, they're dividing light from darkness. And there is no peace during that situation. And that leads to great suffering. And I want you to think about this this morning. Christ doesn't make moves uh, to end their suffering. They're suffering. And the Lord's not doing anything to stop it. And he's not giving them any kind of uh, advice on how to avoid it. Rather, his response is, 
suffer on. Suffer faithfully. Suffer to the very end. And He promises them a glorious crown that He's going to reward them after it's all over with. He's encouraging them with something that is going to take place after their life is over. Be thou faithful unto death. See, it was important for those saints then at that time to have the right attitude about suffering. In fact, is the wrong attitude about suffering would lead them to drastic mistakes and compromises uh, towards corruption. The next development that's highlighted in church history is marked by Pergamos. And that's the 4th century as there's a union that is formed in human government with the, with the church in the name of Christ. And uh, they intended, those saints in making that union, intended simply to end suffering as they know it. And the establishment of that spiritually adulterous uh, establishment of church state came up. Uh, an unscriptural, ungodly situation on the part of human government. It's a power grab. Uh, to get control of a growing church of the Lord Jesus in order to create control and, uh, and, and offer up that peace within the Roman realm. And, and of course, as it goes on in future developments of Thyatira and Sardis, you see that it did not end suffering. <laughs> they did it to end suffering. It did not end suffering. There was great corruption and abominations. There was idolatrous practices that were brought in under the name of Christ. It was all false. It had nothing to do with Christ. It had nothing to do with the Bible. It was pagan idolatry and sin. The church state came along, began to persecute. The church state began to persecute true followers of Jesus Christ and sought to keep the people in the dark by keeping the Scriptures from them. And that's the way they motivated, that's, or that's the way they operated. And, and thanks to God for His men like John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and others there, hundreds of men suffered intense persecution and were faithful throughout their suffering just trying to get the Word of God out into people's hands and complete the work of God as it was commissioned to them. And of course, as that begins to take place, we end up with the authorized version of 1611. This is in the period of Philadelphia, authorized by King James, but it's put out by the most skilled, most educated, gifted men, not to mention Holy Spirit empowered, enabled men to give us the Scriptures in our own language. I'm telling you this morning, God was involved in you having a King James Bible this morning. It wasn't for money, it wasn't for book sales, it wasn't for religious purposes. It was so the common man would have the words of God himself. And brother, when the, when the word of God went out, the lights went out, amen, the, the light went out and the darkness was gone. And the doors were opened and the gospel went out into what is called the missionary age. The church grew. Even a new country was based uh, upon that unprecedented freedom there was formed. And we're talking about the United States of America. This nation we've lived in with unprecedented freedom is the fruit born from the Word of God going out as it did with the King James Bible. But with all the freedoms that we've enjoyed, sadly, you know what's happened. Blessings have fattened us and the last period of the church is marked by materialism and lukewarmness, an age where men have departed from the faith and have turned their ears to fables like the gospel of prosperity nonsense and the name it, claim it garbage, amen, Wretched, Jesus says, miserable, blind, and naked. Carnal worldliness is the norm, and that's the spiritual state of the church in the end. But the good news is, we are at the end. <laughs> Amen. It's about to wrap up. Uh, God has told us in the Word we can know we're in the last days, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, from that information that's given to us. Uh, we don't know how long the last days are going to last, but all this is hinted at there in Revelation 4 is following the coverage of all the developments of all of church history. John says, a door was opened in heaven. A door was opened in heaven and there from the Father's house where Jesus has gone to prepare us a place. He'll come again and call us that we may be where He is. And up and away we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That promise should never have been more precious to you than it is today. Because we're going towards that event. Someone says, well, I've been hearing about the, the Lord's coming for the church for 40 years. Well, I'll tell you what, you're 40 years closer to it. You're 40 years closer to the coming of Christ. I show them from the Scriptures why it is last week there must be a calling up of church-age believers and how that such a promise is a serious part of what we call the faith. And the faith is that body of doctrine we hold to as believers that we see in the Word of God and involved in living by faith is the matter of being sound in the faith. 
Because what you believe affects how you behave. And if you are a believer and you no longer believe in the rapture of the church, you're liable to do something crazy like start hoarding and, you know, <laughs> building bomb shelters and all kinds of crazy things. Amen. Now, some of you probably got a bomb shelter I didn't know about, and I just offended you. But, <laughs> but I'm, not, I'm not looking for any of that. Amen. I'm not looking for the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the tribulation period. I'm looking for the Lord to come. Because that's what he promised. And, and we've seen that in the matter of faith, it enables us to live by faith. This matter of what we call the blessed hope, he says, helps us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Hey, don't you need some help with that? The Bible says this will help you deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly and righteously in this present world as we look for his appearing. We need that promise. It's a helmet, amen, when it comes to spiritual warfare. And it'll translate into a crown at the judgment seat of Christ. The truth of the rapture is not wishful thinking. It's a sure, purifying, blessed hope. As those opponents of that doctrine want to make your objections and disapprove of this Bible doctrine by nothing more than a careless approach to the words of God. And we illustrated that last week there. They confused the world scene with the tribulation period in the last days of the church age. They confused Israel with the church. Uh, they confused uh, the last trump of God with the seventh trumpet of the seventh angel. So, so naturally, they're going to confuse the church age with the tribulation period. They got confused because they started out that way. And that's just the problem. We will be raptured. There's no doubt about it. There's no second guessing about the blessed hope and the promise of Christ to call us home. There's no guessing about it at all. Here in Revelation chapter 4, John, a male type of the church like Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, gets raptured out into heaven like Enoch did in Genesis chapter 5. And the heavens open. The heavens open, there's a calling up like you see in Song of Solomon chapter 2 also showing the rapture. There's a voice as you read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 which is speaking about the rapture. Uh, there is a Voice like a trumpet, which is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, both speaking about the rapture. The phrase, come up hither, is not just a calling up, it's a calling away into a place, like the bridegroom says in the Song of Solomon. He says to the bride, rise up, my love, and come away. Jesus said that we would be where, where He is. We're going to a place, we're not just getting out of here. We're going to be in heaven, we're going to be there from which we look for our Savior who will fashion this body like unto His glorious body. That's what we're looking for. John says immediately here in the passage, uh, cross-referencing the phrase, in the twinkling of an eye, He's changed. He, he says in the Spirit, and, and, and in the Spirit, I know down south, a lot of folks think in the Spirit means you're feeling good, but in the Spirit in the Bible means you're being moved from one place to another. In the book of Ezekiel, when He went in the Spirit, the Spirit of God just picked Him up and take Him to a place. In the book of Revelation, when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the Spirit of God moved him from 96 A.D. to the second coming of Christ. He didn't just get moved from one place to another. He got moved from one time to another. And here John mentions that, and he begins to talk about being translated. All that's pointing to the rapture, brethren. It is a blessed hope. It is a Bible doctrine. It's not to be denied. There, there's something else alluded to in these verses there's something else that's going to follow the event of the calling up, and it's the event of giving an account. We're excited about the rapture. We mentioned the judgment of the cross, and it's kind of like somebody raining on our parade. <laughs> but folks, one's just as sure as the other. As sure as God lives, we will give account to Him. He's in charge. He, he, he says what goes, and if we don't follow, we'll give account. And here He gives the admonition, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith under the churches there. It leads us right up to the calling up. The calling up, and then immediately there's the veiled reference to the judgment seat of Christ, given all the saints are there by Revelation 5, showing the raptures happened. Many of them are wearing and casting crowns, showing that the judgment seat of Christ has happened. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In our lives, we're gaining ground, as I said, towards the coming of Christ. We're going towards that event. We're destined to stand before the Lord of all, and we will give an account. We're not going to sit back and watch a movie of our life. We're going to give an account. We're going to have some input. What we did. Why we did it. Where we were. Where we should be. 
All those kind of things are going to come up. He's going to examine. The king will. Our service and our labors. And he's going to reward some for their work. And for others, their work is going to suffer loss of reward. But, it's, but we're all going to have to stand before the scrutiny of the all-knowing God. He knows it all. No excuses. There's no getting out of this. There's no reason and out of this. It is what it is. As members of the church of the Lord Jesus, we, we better hear what the Spirit's trying to tell us. We better listen. Was there a reason for the warning given to Ephesus? Was there a reason why Christ would tell those saints, you've left your first love? There was. Was there a reason for the encouragement given to Smyrna? Because of their intense suffering, he could say to them, Be thou faithful unto death. There was a reason for that. Was what happened during the period of Pergamos uh, important enough to mention? It was. Is this last period of church history we're living in, is it a period of lukewarmness, spiritual misery and wretchedness and materialism? You better believe it. You'd have to be blind not to know it. He that has ears to hear better listen to what John wrote. And what the Spirit is saying to us, I mean... 2,000 years of historical highlighting here in these two chapters that we've seen, we look back and we see it happened, all pointing towards an exit. Saints going out of this world and us standing before the throne. John said, when I got up there, there was a throne. When I got up there, when I was called out of here, there was a throne. And there was one that sat upon the throne. Faith is a believing response to the revelation we're given. Living by faith uh, very much is made up of living with a, the expectation of the undated, imminent return of Jesus Christ. Meaning for all the believers that have come and gone and died and passed off the scene, that spent and lived their lives looking up, waiting for Jesus to come, they were right. You say, well, no, 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 they weren't right. Yes, they were right. You are right to look for Him to come. Because he promised he was coming. He said, well, some of them thought they knew when he was coming. So they missed it. <laughs> All right? I know that's supposed to be the unpardonable sin today. But, but again, man, just back off a little bit. What you know is he said he was coming. He didn't tell us when. He didn't tell us when. We don't get points for guessing when. If I could guess the very date, and I said it was tomorrow at 3 o'clock, when we got to heaven... You think I could say, hey, I was right. <laughs> you think anybody would care? <laughs> they, they'd care if I was wrong. <laughs> they, <laughs> they sure would. You look like a fool guessing that stuff and not getting it right. <laughs> Somebody told me this morning in Bible Institute that, that, that today was supposed to be another one of those end of the world days. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> Here's what I know is he said he was coming. He said he was coming. You know what's right for me to do today? Look for him. Well, he may not come. Yeah, but he said he was. I don't have to get it right. I just have to live with that expectancy that he could come today. The Lord could come today. One day, following that, I'll stand before the throne of the one who loved me and gave himself for me and has commissioned me to his service. And he's paying attention to what I'm doing. And he's paying attention to why I'm doing it. And I'm going to give an account. Living by faith right now today involves those two things. I don't know what's going to happen to the market. I don't know what's going to happen to gold. I don't know what's going to happen to Scott County and development and growth and all. I don't know about any of that. What I do know is one of these days we're all going up. And we shall all stand before the jump seat of Christ and give account of ourselves. Now he says over in chapter 5, notice this. It, we're, we're to live here in, in light of this information we're given in these two chapters uh, the anticipation and the reason for the crowns. Notice chapter 5 verse 9. Chapter 5 verse 9 says, And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. Notice, And we shall reign on the earth. Now, I hope you see that. That's anticipation of what's coming. And there's no getting around this. This is all the redeemed around the revelation of the Redeemer and the glory of His revealed worthiness. This blood-washed throng belongs to Him. The people of Jacob belong to Him. The promised land belongs to Him. The throne of Israel belongs to Him. All the kingdoms of the world belong to Him. 
And here are all the redeemed in heaven in this scene, every last one of us. We're already in heaven. Right? We're already around the throne of God. And you know what we're anticipating? Coming back to earth. We're coming back with the Redeemer. And it says, for the purpose of reigning on the earth. Now, that's what it says. Now, the right to reign is a part of a conditional inheritance that, that comes with suffering with Jesus Christ. We're not talking about getting to heaven. We're talking about part of a, an inheritance that allows us to reign with Jesus Christ, and you've got to suffer for Him. To do that, bear His cross, serve the Lord. This will not go without the Father's notice, and it will not go without the re reward of Jesus Christ. He'll reward you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, let me read this to you. It says, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Listen. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, living by faith is not a matter of knowing when Christ is coming, but it is a matter of knowing that He is coming. Living by faith is expecting Him to come, and so we live by that expectation, awaiting what He calls the manifestation of the sons of God to the glory of God's grace. That's what we're waiting for. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing to glory in down here in this world, folks. I mean, this is all passing glory. Well, my team won the Super Bowl. Well, that's this year. There's next year. And it ain't going to matter what they did this year. My, my father's the champion. He won't be forever. Somebody will knock him down. Somebody will wear him out. He's going to lose. He's going to end up in an old folks home there before too much time. Yeah. You understand, this is the way it goes down here. There's no lasting glory down here. But, but there is glory to be revealed in us. There is glory He's going to reveal in us. And it's the glory of God that He says is going to be revealed in us. Therefore, the conditional reward of reigning with Christ is a matter of God's glory to the glory of His grace. That's what God's looking for. It's not about our glory. It's about His glory. And the glory of the Father in the Son and the Son's glory of being Savior in the grace of God. How did, how did one of us end up with a crown on his head reigning with him in glory? i tell you how. Him. That's how. To the glory of his grace, he took someone like us and he allowed them to reign with him as we return back the second time. Those crowns he'll give at the judgment seat and display his glory as king. The king gets to put the crown on the heads of those that will reign with That's why you wear a crown, right? It's involved in a reign, and he puts the crowns on those heads of, that deserve it. And then his glory also is, is seen as a son. He's glorying in the Father, and he's putting the crowns on the head, and his glory is seen as Savior because he redeemed us by his blood. And we're just sinners saved by his grace. There in Revelation 5, all the redeemed are gathered there. Some of them are wearing crowns. Crowns that were given by the Lord. They're, they're looking forward to coming back down to earth, manifesting the glory of Jesus Christ, the worthy Lamb, the only one that is worthy. They're looking forward to Him reigning on the earth, and they want to be with Him. Now it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Listen, if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. And these crowns will be rewarded, spoken of distinctly. There's five of them in the New Testament. 
There is, of course, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul speaking to the converts there that he had in Thessalonica, uh, people he won to Christ through witnessing and teaching and preaching. Uh, he tells them that they are the crown of his rejoicing, that they were the crown of his rejoicing. He's speaking how they, uh, they as, as he bore witness to them, and they now bear witness uh, to this specific reward for him. They are the crown of his rejoicing. If that's the case there, every person that you've had a part in Hearing the gospel and being saved, they represent a crown for you. That part of God's glory that will be revealed in you. Amen. You, you might have been somebody to just help break up the ground. Amen. You might have witnessed to them they didn't get saved. But you know what happened after you were gone? Somebody else came. And based on what you said and the Spirit of God and the work that He did with what you said, somebody else came along and... And they might have sowed some seed there where you broke up the ground and then somebody else came along and they watered the ground. And then a little bit later there, somebody else protected the seed that was sown there and, and made an argument they didn't know about and somebody else came through and said, Hey, you know what? Don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time you believed on Christ? And they said, Yes, sir, I think it's time. And they got saved. And we may say, Well, that one there that was there, he's the one that won them. But it wasn't just him. It was a group of people there that God used to come through there. And the Lord's taking note of who's doing what. Some water and plant, amen, but God gives the increase. And the Lord's watching. He's watching. He talks about that crown of rejoicing there. And, and he says in Psalms 126, 5, he says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Brethren, you need to be doing something. <laughs> Amen. John went up there before we got there. We haven't seen it. We only know what we've been told. But he said, when I got there, there was a throne. And there's someone on it. And Paul says, we shall all give account of ourselves to God at the judgment seat of Christ. That being said, the Lord said, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to reward you with a crown of rejoicing, taking those, those seed and, and weeping and being serious about the word of God going out. And he says, if you'll do that, you'll doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. In other words, you will reap what you sow in this regard of the work of God. It's not for nothing. Amen. There, there's mention in 1 Peter 5, a crown of glory, dealing with taking the oversight of God's flock and caring for His sheep with a proper motive. James 1.12, uh, what was promised there with the church of Smyrna there, they were suffering. He mentions a crown of life, speaking about staying faithful through sufferings and temptations. Amen. That's somebody that didn't give up because somebody didn't pat them on the back. Somebody didn't recognize them. Somebody hurt their feelings. They didn't quit. They didn't get out of church. They didn't, they didn't quit on God. They just kept right on going. The Lord said, I'll reward that. I'll reward you for not quitting, for not giving up, for not throwing in the towel. The Lord said, I, you made it to the end and there's a reward in it for you in regards to that. There's what's called the incorruptible crown given for those that keep their body in subjection. In 1 Corinthians 9, they have rule over their spirit. The flesh doesn't dictate to them. The flesh is not in control. Amen. It's not about self-control. It's about the control of self. And, and they've got their self Governed under the authority of the Word of God. Then again in 2 Timothy 4, 8, as I referred to last week, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. That's the crown of righteousness. It's going to be given at that day. Speaking of the judgment seat of Christ, that day is involved in what the Bible calls the day of Christ. The day of Christ. All of us are going up. All of us will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will return with Jesus Christ. Some of us will reign with Him. Some of us will not. The issue is who gets the crowns? Who gets the crowns? Those who look to His appearing. Hold to that promise. Those who deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly who endure pain and inconvenience and suffering and reproach, those who will give towards the sowing of the gospel, those who will put out tracts and give money to missionaries, amen, those that will witness and break up the fallow ground and warn people and tell others about Jesus Christ. There's, there's a reward in it. There's a reward in it to the glory of God the Father in the Son, to the glory of the Son as the King, as the Son and as your Savior. 
Don't make this about vanity. <laughs> 70 years paying bills, raising kids, buying clothes, making house payments, invest. <laughs> Hear what the Spirit is trying to say. We're headed up. This world's not home. This life isn't all. We're all going to give an account at the jump seat of Christ to how we lived it. God will reward faithfulness. It'll be to His glory. He that hath an ear to hear, we better hear what the Spirit's trying to say to us. Here in chapter 4 and chapter 5, many things, coupling these two things together, there's the sound of the trumpet in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. There's the side of the throne in verse 2 and 3. Verse 4 through 11, there's the surroundings of the throne in chapter 4. Amazing things that John describes right there. And of course, the main attraction is the one on the throne. And then in the next chapter, chapter 5, the seven-sealed book, the slain Lamb of God is revealed. Verses 8 through 14 there, uh, you got the, the song of the saints. They're singing about the Savior in chapter 5. Chapter 5 opens with observation. Notice it says there in chapter 5, verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And again, I believe that, that book is the Word of God. I don't think we're worthy of opening it. There's one that, that, that can open it. He opens it to us. He opens our hearts to His Word. He's the only one worthy. And I believe that in that book right there, that 66 book library, I believe there is documentation for all of this being His. He's the Redeemer. He bought it all. He's worthy. And it's going to be revealed there. It's all His. Who's worthy to take that book out of the throne, out of the hand of Him that sat on the throne? Amen. There's that observation, John says, and there's a proclamation there as he says, who is worthy? And then there's investigation as they find out no one is. Verse 3, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. That means not Moses, not Elijah, not the law, the prophet, not, not David, not Noah, amen, not Joseph, the greatest type of Christ in the Bible, not, not Daniel, not Job, not Paul, not Peter, not Luther, not Tyndale, not Mueller, not Kerry, not Hudson Taylor. Nobody's worthy but one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what John says? John says when that question was asked, who is worthy? John says, I, I wept much. Period of lamentation. I know we like to talk about there's no tears in heaven. That makes for a good sentimental thought. But John's in heaven and he says, I wept much. You know what everybody's doing? Everybody's weeping. The Lord has to wipe those tears away so that shows you there will be tears in heaven. And folks, the reason why there's weeping in this sense right here is because we're not worthy. We're not worthy to open that book. But there is one that is. And that's the consolation in verse 5. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Because he's worthy. Amen. We all get to go to heaven. Because he's worthy. We get to serve him. Because he's worthy. We get to fellowship with God as Father. Because he's worthy. We get to come back and display his glory of his grace. His armies from heaven there. But then just highlighting this passage there, the sixth point there, manifestation, as it's pointed out, who he is and we're told what he does. He says in verse 6, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And man, church breaks out. <laughs> Amen. Church breaks out and they begin to shout and sing. Verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And it's made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say in blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. You know what John says? I was in the spirit. I was called to that point. It's in a time in the future following the judgment seat of Christ. And all those that have just taken all those crowns and cast them at his feet, reviewing back on life, they said, all our might and all our investment and all the strength we had, all the honor, it's due him. Nobody is regretting at the jump seat of Christ anything they've done for him. You know why? Because he's worthy of it. You can pass a tract out for him. You can tell your neighbor about him. Amen. You can get in your car and make an intended visit. Go to someone's house. Pray for them. Amen. Water that seed. Get in there and talk to them. Amen. You say, why? Because he's worthy. What if they don't listen? Okay. That's on them. But he's worthy. He's worthy. Listen, the Father's house has windows and has a door. And one of these days that door is going to open up and we're going up. And the second time when that heavens open up, we're coming down. And when we come down with him, he's going to reign. And there's few of us that get to reign with him. And they're the ones that get the crowns. They get the crowns while we're up there at the judgment seat of Christ. And so this morning, I want you to ask yourself, am I going to get any? You know this morning. You know what you're doing. You may not understand your motive completely, but... Have you been involved in people getting saved, people getting the gospel? Have you been involved? Are you living soberly and righteously and godly in this present world? Are you looking for His appearing? Do you love it? Do you endure trouble and trials and you keep going full, straight ahead? Listen, these are things the Lord says He'll reward with a crown. <laughs> nothing shallow, nothing superficial. That crown represents the right to reign. You know what? There's some folks in here this morning. You're going to get one. <laughs> You're going to get one. And there's some folks in here that's not going to. We're going to be with him and his glory to his grace. We're saved. We're not going to be part of his reign as far as that part of the inheritance. Because some people, when it came to suffering for Jesus Christ, said, I pray thee have me excused. They don't want to bear the reproach. They don't want to put their neck out. They don't want to go that second mile. Life is about them. It's about things. It's about circumstances. It's about pressures. It's about obligations. It's not about Him. What's done for Him is what He's looking at at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to ask you to stand. Every head bowed. Father, I pray You'll bear witness to the truth this morning. Help us, Lord God, as we make examination of our life and what we're doing with it. Lord, to make determinations and Lord, to obligate ourselves towards greater things for your glory. Help us, Lord, we're your people. You bought us with your blood. Help us to serve you by your spirit and your strength, we ask in Jesus' name. As you're standing, everybody in prayer, Miss Robin, when you get ready, you go right ahead and play. But I want to remind you here, John said, the heavens opened, the door opened up there, and a voice called me up, and I went up there, and there was a throne and there was one that sat on the throne. And next thing you hear about is crowns being cast at his feet. They've received some crowns in between that interval of his calling up and them casting those crowns. Paul points out in 2 Timothy that there's a time when those crowns are going to be given. Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5 says that time is the judgment of Christ.